What a beautiful herb garden that the Nashville Herb Society has put in here at Cheekwood Botanical Gardens in Nashville. And we have an expert, Cindy Winker with the Herb Society, and I have to say fellow enthusiastic cook. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you're in charge of this wonderful culinary herb garden mm -hmm. that I'm envious of. <laughs> Tell, let's get let's talk about some herbs that are a little different because we know them and grow them as far as basil, parsley, mm -hmm. oregano, but you've got some unusual ones. We do. We have some really fun herbs. The lovage is a really great place to start. Um, it looks like celery, acts like celery, tastes like celery. Uh, you can use it as a celery substitute in cooking. Uh, you can make a great straw for a Bloody Mary because the stems are hollow. So when you cut that stem off, you've got a lovage straw and you can use it to uh, decorate your Bloody Mary and doubles as a straw. It is perennial here. So you can see this is a new one, but you can see the small ones that are beginning to come up after the winter. Right, so, and, and for some reason, my grandmother called this smallage. Oh. Um, but it doesn't uh -huh. stay very small. It can no. get pretty tall. About, about two feet. Yeah. Uh-huh, so it will get about two feet tall, but you know, the, the interesting thing about herbs, they've been with us since the beginning of mankind, so they have all kinds of legends and stories, and so your grandma probably had some <laughs> something that mattered to her. Exactly. And that's why she called it smallage, but it will get about two feet tall, and you cut it back in the winter time, and mulch it heavily, and it pops its little head right back up in the spring. And obviously it's a sun lover. Sun lover, uh, it, and most of these like the sun. It, you know, a little bit of shade in our hot Tennessee afternoons doesn't hurt. None of them are offended by that. That's right, um, and neither am I. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And let's go over here to this other one that I absolutely love. Sorrel. Sorrel. Mm -hmm. So tell me all about this, because a lot of people don't think of it as an herb. Right, and it's, I think it's one of those herbs that can almost be used as a vegetable. You yeah. Know, so it's a little bit of both. But it is one that is, would enjoy some afternoon shade. Uh, and we get uh, more shade than you realize here in this garden. It is perennial, it will pop back up. Uh, again, do the same thing, cut it back, mulch it, and up it comes. This is a plant from the last several years, so this is new, come newly sprung this year. And I tend to use it kind of like spinach. You can use it like spinach, you can pop it in some eggs, you can do all kinds of things with it. It has a bright flavor that really livens stuff up. Uh, it makes a great lovage soup. Uh, and those recipes are, you know, kind of all over the internet. Right. But, you know, but it right. makes a great soup. Good in um, any of those things that you could use spinach for, really. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of mm -hmm. how I use it. And mine, uh -huh. I never get it to bloom because I'm cutting yeah. on it all the yeah. time. Mine at home bloomed and I thought, ah, how'd that happen? So yeah, <laughs> I do, we pop it off. Yeah. <laughs> and let's talk about another brightener, mm -hmm. lemon verbena. Lemon verbena has become one of my favorite herbs. It is not perennial here. It is in a warmer locations, but it's not here. Occasionally, it will winter over and come back up in the garden, but it is only occasionally. You harvest it when it's at least 10 inches tall. You usually cut about a quarter of the stem off, cut it at a joint, so it continues to you know, bush out and multiply. It is, a, it is the most intense of all the lemon scented herbs. It has the most of that per square inch of all of the lemon scented herbs. It, it almost, it's kind of got a sticky it feel does. to it. It does, and so when you cook with it, you make a lot of syrups with it, or a lot of infusions, and you strain that out. I make a great um, verbena cream that I pour over berries in the summertime that I have tossed in a lemon verbena syrup. It's delicious. It, it, it's very perfumey. Very perfumey. And you usually want to make some sort of infusion out of those leaves because they are, they're, they're hard. They're a little sticky. And so it really works really good. You have to chop it really, really, really fine if you're going to use it in a cookie or a cake or a bread. Uh, you can use it as a substitute for lemon zest. I mean, zest, I'm sorry. How many times have you gone, ah, um, I need lemon zest. I don't have any. We well, can pop into the garden. You can harvest some lemon verbena, chop it up really, really, really fine, and you've got a, a substitute for lemon zest. And let's talk about one that we don't normally think of uh -huh. as 
an, another herb that obviously does, again, very well. It does, it likes it. We'll get kind of tired in the summertime. Salad and, you know, but How many is it? Salad burnet, that's exactly right. Uh, again, one of the things I love about herbs uh, is that they kind of have this really interesting history. And the Romans carry that into battle with them because it's also medicinal and it controls bleeding. So they oh. would carry that into battle with them thinking if they got a wound, it could prevent the hemorrhage and save their lives. But it's a, a, in the rose family, which I think is kind of unusual. And you can use the leaves in eggs, salads, um, anything that wants that bright, bright flavor. Yeah, it's just kind of, um, it's one of those things that, in my mind that what is that? You uh -huh. taste it, uh -huh. but you're not exactly, exactly. sure what it exactly. is. Yeah. But it's delicious. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun, easy, and all of these are really easy herbs to grow. Well, and that's what we like, uh -huh. don't we? We like things yeah. that just kind of take care of themselves. Exactly. exactly. And speaking of taking speaking care of, of itself. Speaking of taking care of itself and everybody else. <laughs> yes. We have got horseradish. Mm -hmm. And tell me how you have done this because you've got this in a pot. So we have it in a bottomless pot. Horseradish is considered invasive. It will absolutely take over. There are several plants in here that would have a main taproot, and that's the big horseradish that you would see if you bought it fresh. You can dig it, cut those taproots off, or cut the little extensions of the taproots off stick them anywhere, they will grow everywhere. If I were to dig this up and think I had completely eradicated it, next spring I would come back and it would be here. Uh, so it just fools you. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you harvest it generally. It's a long time to harvest horseradishes. So if you plant it in the spring, you want to harvest it in the fall. Um, and you can, there's a lot of ways to preserve it. Um, I think the best way is cold and dry, cool and dry somewhere, but it's a, you can eat the little leaves. When you get these new little leaves down here, they have a little bit of a pop, and you can cut them up, put it in a salad, and it has just a little pop in your salad. Um, it's, a fun, it's a fun thing to grow, as long as you contain it and don't let it take over your garden, and because it will. Does this need a lot of water? Because it looks, it looks like it would. Uh, it gets water pretty regularly. I don't think you'd, you can overwater it. You, know, you can overwater any tuberous and then they just turn to mush. Yeah. So uh, once it's established, you have to let, I would let it dry out between waterings or let, you know, nature take care of it. And, and when you, when you pick the little mm -hmm. leaves, mm -hmm. you're picking the babies. I'm you're picking not the babies. doing anything with these yeah, right here. I, these are bitter. Yeah, but these little babies just are pop. Cindy, what about this? Well, makes this, it so invasive, this horseradish. Well, this is the yummy part. It's also the invasive part. These are the roots of the horseradish. And these babies will just spread and spread and spread underneath the soil, so much so that you don't even see them um, because they're so pervasive, invasive. But but that's this is the yummy part. This is great to put on your meat that you can use in the culinary part. But it's, they are. Uh, and it gets much bigger, like you said. It gets much bigger. The taproot, these were the side runners off of the taproot in my garden. The taproot in my garden will be about that big. It will be really large. What about the flowers? Can you do anything with that? Uh, Tammy, I've not done anything with the flowers. Um, and I let mine go again because it's kind of wild. And, and it, I get the horseradish off, which is, which is really what I'm growing it for. I'm supposed to be a great garnish. C correct. Yeah, correct. But I've not ever used them for thin anything specific. So herbs that can be dried, and almost all of these are able to be dried. Thyme and winter savory is another herbs that we haven't even talked about this morning. But you can just harvest them. You harvest them in the morning when they're early in the morning. They're at their most flavorful. Let them dry out on their own. And then you can use a dehydrator or you can use a, a grocery bag, a brown grocery bag. Take the dry herbs, when I say dry, I mean not wet with moisture, water, or whatever you wash them with. Let that go away. Put them in the brown paper bag, roll it up nice and tight, stick it in a cool, dark place, and then weeks, go back, pull them out, strip them off, put them in your jars, and you have them all winter long. 
Cindy, y'all have an annual plant sale. We do. Uh -huh. And it's every April. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, and you sell how many? 10,000 plants. Wow. Um, it's really the, the event that allows the Herb Society to sustain itself. And I think that the reason that is important is that we also have a grant branch of our Herb Society. This year we awarded $8,900 to 11 community agencies that are in food, that really serve food challenged communities to teach them how to raise the herbs, to help them really begin to be self, more self-sustaining. And we think that that community service is really important. We support this garden entirely. We have another garden that we support in Centennial Art Center. So we, um, we provide a great service, we think to I, the community. I believe and it. And that plant sale is a sustaining feature uh, that allows us to continue our operations. Uh -huh, some new stuff, fun stuff, and the history of all these herbs. They, herbs are really the gift that really keeps on giving because all of these, generally all of them, can be dried and used all winter long. Right. So there's a, there are truly a gift to our, our soul and our palate. And you know what, Cindy? You're <laughs> uh -huh. a gift to us and our viewers. So thank you so much well, you're for very this welcome. and your knowledge of this. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, we love what you're doing. Thank well, you thank for you. the Herb Society yeah. and for, for helping us today. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting us talk about it. Great. Uh -huh. If you like gardening, you'll want to subscribe to our channel. Home gardening tips, tips from growers, and lots of plants. Until next time.